Hello, folks. It's Bradley J, champion of the unusual. That's, by the way, my new tag, my new line that Dave Hurley gave me. I like it a lot. Champion hesitation of the unusual. And today we have just that. We have a little bit of the un unusual. We have Elizabeth Waterman, who is author of Money Game, and that's a photo book on strippers in the United States. So, hi, how are you? It's so great to be here, and I love sharing about my work, so thank you for having me. Of course. Well, tell me about the book. It's a photo book. So I, for four years, <laughs> I was in strip clubs all across America taking pictures because I think that in another life, maybe I would be a stripper because I think they're fascinating and beautiful, and I look up to them, and I thought, how cool would it be if I could take pictures of their world and share it with people? Like People would really want to see that. I haven't seen that done so often. And it led to this grand adventure. And I was in Vegas. I was in Miami. I was in the party clubs in Miami. Girls were hanging off the ceiling. I was in you know, New Orleans on Bourbon Street, Mardi Gras with all the strip clubs and everyone's packed. I was in you know, LA at like the strip clubs in the Valley where the porn stars go and strip. And it was just this chronic cross section of culture, of strip club culture. and. It was edited and curated and put together in my first book, which was published several years ago. The name is Money Game. And people responded really well. The strippers loved it, which was the greatest honor, but men and women loved it. It really showed that life. Do strippers qualify as sex workers? You know, I think you have to ask the stripper. I see. Because I think some don't mind being called sex workers, but some- It's not very sexy. <laughs> sex worker. I'm down in the sex mine. My, uh, okay, so you took the, the photos for this book. It's not that you just have all your life taken these photos from time to time and collected them, put them in a book. You took them for the book. It was a project. It was a project, but the editor certainly helped to make it a book. It was kind of a bit all over the place. And I've been lucky also since the book has been published. Um, Anderson Uzerski, there's a show up right now, and the curator actually pulled even more images from the project that weren't in the book to be seen. So the project kind of is continuing. It's ongoing. So there's actually more images than are just in the book. All right. So that show going on right now is in Boston, right? That's in Boston. Anderson Uzerski and Renee, the curator, a gallery owner, she has like made put together an amazing show. And it really shows the women as these powerful creatures. She really pulled those images it's got a very particular vibe to it it's beautiful you should go see it it's all black and white it's i think there's one set of nipples okay but the rest is really pg-13 so you can bring your kids probably a set of two two nipples <laughs> okay there's a set, a full set all right uh so anderson yuzerski gallery is in the soa district in yes uh near on near or just off washington street or i guess it's on washington yeah, street. Mayor street yeah all right good now What's your artist statement on this project? What is, what is the message uh, that you either set out to disseminate or that one that popped up after after doing the project? My guess is that uh, you, you came to find out that being a stripper is a job like any other job and it, and it's hard work and stuff like that. They're, that. they're just people too kind of thing. There was that kind of message for sure. I think perhaps what some of the surprising things that came out of the project that I took away and continue to take away was, first of all, how, and again, I was really with focusing on dancers that were happy to be dancing, wanted to be dancing, chose to be dancing. So I don't want to discard that there are some dancers that are it's not good for them to be dancing and it's not appropriate and they, they don't, they're not doing well there. So but not every dancer is doing it because of dire economic circumstances. Some do it because it's good money and it's fun. Right. That's this book. That's this first book. That's what I'm focusing on. So I got to hang out with women that were, uh, there was a lot of empowerment around their body, their sexuality, ownership of their sexuality. Um, and that was for someone who grew up in a very conservative background that was really kind of healing and therapeutic to be around. All these sexy women that were not ashamed or bashed up their sexuality, but were capitalizing on it. Now so that's you, one side of the story, but that I did take a lot from that piece. So you 
probably became quite a connoisseur of strippers and you yes, probably... I like to think of myself as a stripper connoisseur absolutely so you I'll probably maybe you probably came to see what made some successful and some not so successful like what what makes you a good stripper for sure, I could give some layperson's tips and tricks, <laughs> although my, my experience in the field itself, hands-on, is limited. But I think that you definitely see women who strip for a while and they're like in their 30s and they start to really nail it because they're really serious about, they're more business-minded, they limit their kind of drinking, they're there to make money, they have regulars, and they just slay. And so they're kind of great examples of who to look for for someone who's really working in the game. Um, so yeah. Do they get paid zero? It's all tips. Do they get paid zero for what? Do they get paid zero and only get paid the only money they make is tips? You know, it's a great question. The law is actually changing a lot right now across the country. So different states have different laws. Um, in the majority of the country, a dancer actually pays a fee to the establishment to use the facilities. All right. And then they make money on stage dances where they get tips. And then they also take a percentage of lap dances and VIP rooms. And they also keep tips in there as well. So that's so, kind of the majority of the United States. Let's take an average, average place. How much is a lap dance? Um, I mean, I think it varies, but Usually, I think they, a starter one is like 20 or 30 bucks. 20 or 30 bucks. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a very different vibe regarding strip clubs in Los Angeles than in Boston. Yeah, I remember going, <laughs> going in in Boston. It, it was like you were committing a crime. They look, it look, it's very serious. Big mean guys at the door. Oh, okay, go in there. The minute you go in there, they're all over you trying to say, you know, do you, do you want a drink? Yeah, you better have a drink. It's going to cost you 20 bucks for a beer. Yeah, it's it's super high pressure, and that's what I thought it all was. But then it's different in Los Angeles. I What was it? Is there a place called Crazy Girls? Yes, Crazy Girls. Okay. Yeah. So I, I remember Crazy Girls and then Jumbo's Clown Room. Of course. Which Legend. might be a good name for band. I bet you there's no band named that. That would be pretty good. And the vibe was a whole lot different. It was relaxed. It, w it wasn't like, like this is bad. This is a sin. If anybody finds out, the cops are going to come in. Out there, it was just a kind of a another thing to do. Instead of going to a restaurant, it was way more laid back and less high pressure. -y. Would you concur? There was less puritanism baked into the culture in Los Angeles. And that's it. A little freer in our stripping. So, have you? Are you from here? No, you're probably not, right? So I'm. I'm a proud Chicagoan. I grew up in Chicago. Okay. But I did spend a good year in Massachusetts. When I, spent, I went to photo school in Western Mass in Greenfield, like a school that's no longer in existence. But I did go there. I was in Boston every weekend. Shooting. So did were you here before they sort of di diluted? The combat zone? Did we? Did you get to see the combative concept combat zone? No. I like the I naked eye? Know. Was the naked eye here when you came? No. Oh, oh. Well, there used to be a significant, uh, small but very active area here, and actually, there's a book by a colleague of mine that I suggested called "The Other Red Line." I suggested the title "The Other Red Line." Oh. There's a red line in Boston that's a community it's a the mbta it's a, you know the subway yeah. the other red line is the combat zone and he has uh, done quite an extensive book with lots of good photos i think you would dig it his name is anthony anthony samarco yeah. it's definitely 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 something that you would want to see partly because uh, you know you are you do the same thing but partly because it's a good dose of what the combat zone in boston was yeah, I'm intrigued. I'm definitely going to look into this. I mean, there are some amazing photographers like that I admire for my work that have come out of kind of the Northeast. I mean, Susan Mizellis is like one of the greatest stri stripper photographer women of all time. And she did a lot of her work in the Northeast when she did her book on carnival strippers back in the 70s. So 
the Northeast is definitely the birthplace of much good art. So as you, uh, you know, sports photographers, various photographers of various dis disciplines, there are certain types of shots they want to get, certain situations in baseball, football. What are those situations in Stripperville? Oh, my God. I love that you compared it to sports photography because it totally is. It's so great. Um, it is like sports photography. You're, you're, you're perched in the like dark corner of the club and you've got your lens and you're holding very still and you're kind of hiding and you're waiting for the beautiful stripper to grace the stage and strike the pose on the floor and get her in focus and the lighting is right and it's kind of a waiting act. So, you know, you definitely, every club has different lighting. So you're always trying to find the best lighting and then you wait for the dancer that gave you permission of which there all, might only be a few. You're perched right. next to the stage if it's a stage shot and you're waiting for that moment of transcendence where so, they flip or they spin or they're upside down and they're just in a moment of silence and stillness and it's just amazing. When nature photographers do their thing, they probably have to go out into the wild and sit still for hours and hours and hours and hours waiting for the scarlet tanager or whatever bird they want to take a picture of to come by. Oh, finally, there he is. Is it the same way with you? Do you have to wait a long time for that that special moment? Sometimes. Sometimes, right? It depends. But there were times at the Hustler Club in Las Vegas. And the Hustler Club in Las Vegas, by the way, is like four stories. And they have a 100-foot pole. Shout out to them. They're fabulous. And so... 100 feet high? Have you seen it? No. I'm, I'm asking. 100 feet high? 100 feet high. And the girls will climb to the top. There are some girls that will climb to the top. So they gave me a position where I was up at the top of the pole in a VIP room looking down on the stage with a long lens. And it, they ran the air conditioning so hardcore. So I legit was up there in snow boots and like a snow jacket because it was so cold. And I was up there for like three hours sitting still with my lens looking down on the stage for the, you know, the two dancers that gave me permission to strike the right pose in the right light. And I did feel like a nature photographer kind of watching birds or whatever like from what i've heard it, it did ring it did resonate like that so you mentioned the the show at the yazerski gallery here can you give me that whole name again for everybody oh well, the show is anderson yazerski anderson yazerski yeah. now you some folks in los angeles will see this uh, the show is coming to los angeles too right so i'm really proud and honored to announce that the money game body of work is coming to los angeles but the show that will be shown there is actually special work. So it's from the same project, but it's I, I had an extraordinary experience in February and I went to Bangkok, Thailand, and I photographed at the go-go bars there for three weeks. And I came, it was some of the best work I've ever done. And so a body of that work will be shown at like a Los Angeles this fall, along with for money game classics from like the book era mm -hmm. and i have like different eras of stripper photography forgive me and then i even have one portrait in the Leica show of a transgender stripper in los angeles so how are the go-go clubs in bangkok different than say los angeles they're completely different i mean it's a first of all it's really i mean it's different how is it even the same <clears throat> they're not that much the same really it's full service so you're really and i mean i i really do find thailand an amazing place and respectful and like <clears throat> i know it's a sensitive issue for the country because sex work is technically illegal and the sex workers in thailand are fighting right now for more rights and privileges because they are a big part of the community there and a big part of the economy so there's laws right now that are moving to get passed in parliament to give sex workers more rights. And I really want to honor that and support that. So. So when you say full service, the expectations in, in that those places are different than the expectations here. Yeah. I mean, the oftentimes the bars, the, the, the clubs themselves in Thailand are just go-go dancers. It's go-go dancers dancing and clients will come in. There's some areas, the ones I visited are really for tourists from out of towners. They will come and they will meet with the girls, sit with the girls, have drinks with the girls, buy drinks for the girls. And then there are other services that might happen separately outside the jurisdiction of the club later. Okay. I had another question. Oh, 
So do you get any pushback from the woke community? In Thailand? No, here. Here? Yeah. I think. I mean, I guess that's a no. Are you? You'd know no, if you did. Honestly, I mean, there, there. I would say the majority of the reception to my work is positive. Of course, everyone will remember, like just like I do, the the negative things sometimes that people say. Yeah. You know, the th the through lines of any criticisms of my work are that I might be taking advantage of a community, like that I'm monetizing on images of these dancers yeah. and they're not getting credit for them and. That mostly just comes from people not quite understanding that, you know, what I'm, it is, right? Yeah, and that and how the how the money to fund this book really happened, and that I was the one behind most of it, and that right. So they might view it as exploitation, that. where you view it as empowerment. Right, and I mean, I guess they some sometimes people think that I'm like making like boatloads of money off this project and it's really more of a showcase of my work and it's not necessarily like a like making me a bazillionaire in the background like so i think sometimes you know if there's just a misinformation about that and some women might get frustrated by that or feel like strippers i think are sex workers entertainers they can be sensitive to be taken advantage of because they right. are taken advantage of a lot and oftentimes they are in positions where they can't really retaliate given the setup, they're freelancers in the club. They might not have like unionization organization to speak on their behalf. So they're taking advantage of a lot. And so they're sensitive to it. So I think it's like a sensitive point and that's something you just have to be aware of. So we're talking with Elizabeth Waterman about her photo book called Money Game. And uh, it's a, a photo book on strippers in, well, only the United States. Does it include Bangkok, the Bangkok the Bangkok book is forthcoming. So the original Money Game, which is the first book, it's still in, it's still there are some a few copies available, but it's largely sold out. It's just America. Cool. So before we go, the, the name of the book is Money Game, and what is the game? Uh, what, what you know, every business has tricks to get more money out of their customers. What are the tricks? Are the, well, I mean, I think that strip clubs are fascinating because I think they're one of the few places remaining where you're really handling physical money with such emphasis. You know, most of the time money is digitized now, but when you go to a strip club, it's like this tactile exchange of like dollar bills between former and customer. And it's a constant cycle of that. And it's kind of an interesting place where you're really dealing with money. And it is a game that is being played. The women are, you know, they they have a million things they're thinking about that evening of how to make off the most economically like and it's just a fun game because it's almost like you know you're using the actual dollar bills as monopoly pieces on this monopoly board and i don't know where else you really see that these days what's the the range of how the customers treat the, the dancers you know most of the time it's respectful. I mean, you definitely have customers that are disrespectful sometimes I've seen. I don't like seeing it. Um, usually the strip clubs, one of the things that the dancers are paying for, because remember they pay a fee to dance there. They're paying for the security and the rules of the club. So there are security and club owners and there that can like protect the dancers. Back up, if a customer is being problematic, they can kick them out. They can stand up for the dancers. So that's supposed to be in place to help them. But no one likes a stripper. I mean, no one likes a customer that doesn't tip or that right. doesn't tip enough or right. is like sometimes people kind of just treat them not so much like human beings, but more like animals. I mean, that's like I've only seen that a few times. It really made me upset, but it's varied. You know what right. I mean? It's hard to not objectify strippers because they are objects on a stage. So you naturally kind of start to look at them as these beautiful objects or sexy objects if you're a man and not necessarily like a human being. And I think people forget, doesn't excuse it, but you got to remember that these are just people. I only worked in a strip club once as a DJ and that's not much, but it's more than most people. And I did it because I wanted to, I wanted to, but it was a terrible, terrible, terrible experience. I'll tell you, first of all, was like an eight hour shift of being a DJ, which was awful. And the girls didn't know me. So they did, they weren't nice to me. And I would, I also made my money from tips 
from them. So they yeah, get tips, yeah, then, yeah. then the tips trickle down. But being a DJ, you're not just a DJ, I found out. You have, they give you a bunch of ones, a wad of ones, and you got to go to the bartender and trade it in for bigger bills. So I learned two, I learned that, two things. I learned that, and I learned that was a terrible job for me. I didn't like it at all. All right. Well, thank you so much. Now, this book is available everywhere, right? Tell, remind everybody. Well, the, the copies, there's only a, a limited stash that are oh. still available. So you just the best way to acquire one would be to contact me directly and inquire. And I can see how I can help you. Um, for, you know, it, the Anderson Yazerski Show is a great place to see the work. And all the prints that they sell include a book. So that All the is, prints include a book? Yeah. So that's oh. it's kind of... The books are, are selling for a, a handsome amount of money, which I'm really proud of, but it does kind of make the print even more special. Yeah. Um, is that you get a book with it because they are really becoming these kind of precious collector's pieces. I literally have like two boxes of them. That's all they're in the corner of my office right now. And like the rest of them have sold out around the world. Well, how do, do you want people to be able to contact you to ask for a book or you'd rather not? I mean, I love hearing from fans and, you know, so how do they um, contact they you? Probably, if someone's really interested in a book, I would probably encourage them to get a print along with it and contact right. so, and look at the show that's up right now. You can see it on Facebook. Do you want me to? Do you want to give out your Facebook? Sure, Elizabeth One Waterman. So Elizabeth, traditional spelling, E L I Z A B E T H, the number one, like the numero. Yep. And Waterman. Elizabeth Waterman. Waterman, yeah. Or oh. ElizabethWaterman.com. You know, if you go to any one of my links, you'll find the gallery, you'll find my contact information. And um, if you're a dancer out there who has enjoyed the book, I'd love to hear about it. You know, if you have requests, you know, I after the first book came out, I had plus size dancers contact me. They're like, we need representation. I was like, you got it. I'm there. So, you know, if you think there's something I should be photographing, you tell me. Very good. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being with me. And uh, say hello to everybody out there in uh, Los Angeles. We will. Thank you so much. Bye now. And everybody share this. And remember, Christmas is only, what, six months away. You might want, you might want to get one of those prints. That would, be a, that would be a killer gift if you have somebody that you know would like that thing. It's very special. Yes, thank you. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs>